So welcome. Uh, this is uh, EUC 2846, View Enterprise Architecture Design and Implementation Best Practices. My name is John Dodge, and this is Tommy Walker. Uh, you may have uh, attended one of our sessions before, met us before, et cetera. So by a quick show of hands, who has attended any of my design sessions before? The gluttons for punishment, I call you guys. Thank you very much for coming back. appreciate that. Uh, another quick show of hands. Uh, customers and customers here, welcome. We love you guys. Uh, partners or folks in the partner ecosystem, awesome. I love you guys too. Uh, anyone else who hasn't raised their hand yet? <laughs> VCPs. All right. Cool. So it seems like uh, maybe we could uh, sell some certification while we're here. I didn't see a lot of VCP hands. So anyway, welcome. If view architecture design is not in your uh, session attendance plans today, please notify a flight attendant. So apologies, uh, my voice is cracking a little bit. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been indoors where cigarette or cigar smoking is still allowed, and I woke up this morning feeling a little bit uh, uh, kind of like I got a frog in my throat. All right, Tommy, so let's get started, shall we? Absolutely, John. Excellent. Okay, has anyone read the disclaimer slide yet today? Okay, awesome. I won't have a lot to talk about in terms of specific features, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on futures. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on speeds and feeds. Instead, what I aim to do with my session today is to make you really great architects, to make it so that your view designs will stand the test of time, that you'll create great desktops that your users, that your customers will love. Does that sound like a pretty good outcome for this session? Yeah, all right. <clears throat> so again, uh, my name is John Dodge. Uh, I am the Director of Solutions Product Management for VMware. Uh, prior to this role, uh, for three and a half years, uh, I was focused on the end-user computing space. Most recently, uh, I was the senior manager in charge of our uh, global end user computing practice team, of which uh, I shared that leadership role with Tommy. So I've spent a lot of time in this space as solutions product management director. Uh, now I focus on all of our technology stacks. Uh, and for those of you who care a lot about end user computing, the advantage to you is that I'll be able to bring more VMware technology into the end user computing space. Sounds like a pretty cool idea, right? Excellent. All right. So let's get started. I like to talk about concepts, especially foundational concepts. And for those of you who've heard me speak over the years at Partner Exchange or VMworld or uh, the View Bootcamp videos, you know that I tend to spend a little bit of time on that, and I tend to do that up front. So this year, I'm introducing a new concept, not a new idea. It's the same idea that I've been working with for really the past th three and a half, four years, maybe longer. Uh, but this year, I'm introducing this concept of uh, design decision entanglement. Anybody have any ideas what that might be, what that might look like? Maybe you've experienced it before. All right, so let's talk about it. When I refer to design decision entanglement, what I'm referring to is the idea that there are certain design decisions you can make. Of course, uh, those of you who are architects here or learning architecture, maybe experienced architects, you know that there's a lot of decisions you have to make in building a system, right? Anybody surprised by that fact? No? So you're all decision makers here. I really like that. So the idea is that there are certain decisions that if you make them out of sequence, out of order, then you're going to find that you need to remake or reconsider those decisions, and you need to do that constantly. I like to refer to those things as uh, design decision entanglement. In other words, that some decisions are impacted or influenced by other design decisions, and there's a certain hierarchy. So let's get our most entangled decisions out of the way first, and let's build upon that this way over the course of the design process. As my design vision uh, turns into a reality, I find that I don't have to go back, revisit decisions, and redo them. And that's the most important part, because when I constantly have to redo decisions, when you have to constantly redo decisions in your designs, do you think that that improves the quality of the decision-making process, or does it degrade it? What do you, what do you think? Degrades, right? So here, I want to share with you this, this thinking 
so that you can make high quality design decisions the first time. And in some cases, you make them once. In other cases, you're going to make them and then you'll reconsider them and that's it. And then you're done. I like to ask this question a lot. Does that sound like a really good outcome? Okay, so let's start talking about specifics. So there's the big idea. Here's the specifics. It turns out that as I evaluate view design, the operating system choice turns out to be the most entangled decision. Does this surprise anybody here? A quick show of hands. Is, is anybody confused by that? No? So it seems like a pretty obvious conclusion, right? To me, it took about three years to figure that out. So I kind of feel like um, you know, I'm on the low end of the learning curve here. It took me a while to, to come up with that. When we look at that, of course, operating systems demand memory. RAM, specifically. What, what do you know about the, per, perhaps the minimum or common sense requirements for Windows XP memory compared to Windows 7? Anybody shout it out. What does Windows XP need as a kind of a minimum or an average? 512K, right? What about Windows 7? 2K, 50K? Did I hear somebody say 50K? I probably agree. 64. 64K. So, so here we're looking at about, uh, uh, about a gig, gig and a half, two gig. So right off the bat, we know that the operating system choice really directly influences how much uh, memory I assign to a uh, virtual machine. Okay, so we also know that an operating system depends on storage, right? It consumes uh, space on a hard drive. Nobody's surprised by that. But can anybody think of the relationship between memory and storage in the context of view design? Swap files, right? So not only is there a Windows page file, but there's an ESX level swap file. So I really have two uh, entangled decisions that are happening here. What's the size of my page file? And how much space do I have to allocate on my VMDK, on my ESX server, uh, for ESX swap files, vSwap files? So I would say, again, there's probably no one here surprised by the fact that operating systems consume CPU cycles. So what do we know about Windows XP compared to Windows 7? I'm sorry? It's, uh, well, it's cheaper to run, sure, it's cheaper to buy. That's what Microsoft says. So, in fact, Windows XP probably consumes, on average, about half as much CPU cycles as Windows 7, and there are ways to uh, constrain uh, the Windows 7 bloat so that I don't consume quite as much as that. It's not double, I could bring it down uh, to maybe 1.2 times the amount of RAM, uh, sorry, the amount of CPU uh, as uh, Windows XP. So obviously this is tied to the operating system. Now I would say to you that the whole reason why we have desktops, why we have operating systems, is we're trying to connect users with applications and so that they can create and use data. And so applications and operating systems also have a uh, entangled relationship. This entangled relationship basically is that you know, certain applications are certified to run on certain operating systems and Sometimes they're backwards and forward compat compatible, sometimes they're not. So I would say the operating system choice also is entangled with applications. And of course, applications need cycles to run too, so they demand CPU cycles, and now they're entangled. And of course, applications demand memory, so now they're entangled. So you can start to see how this relationship builds. But let's see what would happen if I went the other way. Let's see what would happen if I started with applications. So I look at my list of applications and I decide, well, I'm going to offer this app and that app and the other app uh, through view. What happens? Okay, well, I know that applications consume memory, so I'm going to do my memory size sizing based on the working set of my applications. Seems like a fairly valid, valid choice, right? It's a good start. I know that applications consume storage, so that's good. But then I start to think, well, how much storage do I need? And is there a relationship? Uh, somewhere else in here, I don't know, I've got I've to come back to that. Okay, well then I say, well, I'll figure out storage later and let me concentrate on CPU. Oh, and then I'll blank out my presentation. Well, how much CPU? And then I start to think, well, finally, okay, now I know that my apps have to run an operating system, so let's look at that. Well, then I go, uh-oh. Well, it turns out that the OS also needs CPU memory and storage, so then I have to go through and figure out how much CPU should I allocate 
uh, to the operating system. And then, of course, that helps drive my memory demands and then my storage demands, and then come back to my applications again, and I find myself in this never-ending cycle, reviewing and remaking decisions that I've had to make before. Does this make sense? I think it's probably common sense, but I, I, to me it sort of represents uncommon sense. Uncommon sense is the kind of common sense that you just don't know or you just don't think about in, in such a clear manner. So here's the uncommon sense. Highly entangled decisions must come first unless you really enjoy prolonging the, the uh, architecture design process and revisiting good decisions that you made incorrectly and having to make them again and make them again and make them again. All right, has anyone seen this wheel, this cent centrifuge, as I like to refer to it? Some. Some of you have seen it, but you're not willing to admit it. I can understand that. So I came up with this wheel or this, cent this design centrifuge as an analogy to walk people through the view architecture and design process. And so we've got that big old start button at the top. That's my play button. That's where I like to start my design process. And so I go through a series of discrete phases, making all my entangled decisions early in the phase. All of the early phases have the most entangled decisions. Uh, and then I move on to the next phase. And then it, you'll notice I've got these, uh, these big arrows on the outside. And so they gave me two laser pointers. So I'm like double-fisted laser pointer here. So you notice these big arrows on the outside. What I'm trying to articulate here in my model, in my design model, is that once I go from, from the 12 o'clock position all the way around the centrifuge and I come up, I will go through a second time. The second iteration is when I start to, to compare decisions that I've made later in the process that are entangled with decisions that I made uh, early in the process. In other words, I sort of do a reverse look up on the entanglement. And so there's a... Uh, uh, an entangled relationship between persona, desktop, and pool, and storage design. And in some cases, I might get nearly all the way through the uh, design centrifuge and hit upon storage design, and I realize that the cost of the SAN that I'll need to support the design that I've created thus far is too high. And now I have to revisit my design to make the, uh, the storage uh, system fit inside my budgetary constraints. Well, when that happens, did I make any changes in the storage design that would then constrain or change decisions I made in persona, desktop, and pool? Is this making sense? Anyone thinks it's total rubbish? You can tell me. I'm not thin-skinned. I won't buy any drinks. Okay. So I'd also like to talk about something else that I think is fairly well-thought-out ideas and I'd like to put a fresh spin on it. I'd like to talk about use cases. Has anybody heard of the term use case before? Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of proliferation of that idea. And so I'm, I'm beginning to look at use cases a little bit differently. In the, in the Agile framework, uh, we're starting to call them stories. I think that that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it uh, is in terms of outcomes, jobs, and constraints. So what do I mean by that? So let's talk about outcomes. Outcomes are uh, ways of looking at the user experience in terms of results, not in terms of what do they have to do, not in terms of requirements, but results. These outcomes can be things like faster logins, uh, better performance, the ability to work uh, from anywhere, the ability to gain access to my applications, and data, and things like that. Some of these things feel like requirements, and in effect they are, they're outcome requirements. And if I'm locked in and focused on the outcomes that I'm trying to drive to my users, then I can be sure that I'm going to design them a desktop that they love. And of course we all know that users love their desktops, right? Has anybody met a user that doesn't love their, their desktop? Raise their hand. Come on. Uh, a couple more hands come up. Okay, I'll admit it. We know that, for the most part, users, they love and they hate their desktop. They love their desktop because it enables them to do their job and, you know, it uh, provides uh, income for the family and so uh, provides for everything that, need, that they need. Uh, they also hate their desktops too, don't they? Why do users hate their desktops? Because they don't work. Very crisply put, sir. 
So when those users, when those, uh, users have desktop that they don't, that doesn't work, they're, they're pretty angry. So we want to describe an outcome as a desktop that always works. In the legacy desktop design model, I feel that the approach is that we create all of these standardized processes. We do OS uh, image management, application distribution, patch management, et cetera, et cetera. We have all these related processes, uh, I ITSM and ITIL all help us drive uh, a architecture and desktop. But the funny thing is that when I think about desktops today in terms of what VMware is doing for desktops in the future, what I see is that we've got all these processes that are very unified, and at the end of the day, I create a unique desktop. And I multiply that by 1,000, 10,000, 20,000 times. So I've got 20,000 unique entities all, all out there in my world, in my universe. I'm not managing them together. I have to consider that you know, there are things that I could do broadly, like push patches and, and push out applications. But broadly speaking, they're not really being managed together, not in the way that... VMware is looking to wrangle in uh, the, the, uh, the desktop in the post-PC era, which is where I find the beginning of the journey today. Today, we are at the beginning of the post-PC era. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is the jobs that users do. And this is kind of closer to where we get to use cases. So can somebody shout out an example of a job that a user might do? What? Data entry, absolutely. What's that? Another one? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Accounting functions, absolutely, using applications. Uh, so other jobs that users do, they communicate with uh, coworkers and customers and business partners, et cetera, so they use what for that? Email, unified communications, maybe their phone routes through their desktop, et cetera, et cetera. So when you start to think about the jobs that the users are doing, we could start to think about the things that they need to execute upon those jobs, to do those jobs. They need apps. They need access to data. They need to print. When are we going to start printing, people? That's what I want to know. I, I found that I hadn't turned on my printer for like three weeks. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm not printing anymore. That's so great. But users print. And what happens when users can't print? It's the end of the world, right? They get so angry. So these are jobs. People need to print documents for some reason. I think they print documents so they can carry them to their desk, uh, cover up a surface, of the, a surface area of their desk for about two or three weeks, and then they recycle that paper. So I would really say that the whole purpose of printing is recycling. That's the job that they're doing in that stage. But when we focus on these jobs that the users are doing, we can be really intently focus on what do we have to create to satisfy those jobs. And so I would say that jobs are very important. And then finally, what are the constraints that we have to design to? What, give me an example of a desktop constraint. I'm sorry? Can't, can't carry certain desktops with you, right? Uh, uh, but maybe that's a constraint that's related to security. You can't take that desktop out of the building can't take that data out of the building. You can't take that application with you on the road, et cetera, et cetera. So we start to think about what constraints apply to the user environment, to the user's desktop environment. What constraints do we need to manage to? Maybe I have to ensure that they're always logging in using uh, an RSA token, et cetera. So at the end of the day, we're still thinking in terms of use cases, and so I want to articulate ways of managing those use cases. And so this is, this is how we roll at VMware. We start getting you thinking about new ways to think. We start to get you to think about tomorrow, but then we provide you an uh, enablement for today. So when I think about use cases, these are the attributes and the classifications I like to put use cases in. Uh, so we have a, a few generalized requirements, applications, OSs, and devices. Users love their devices, don't they? We also have workload categories, which is what I use to uh, sort of uh, map uh, the, the standard categories that we used to have, like knowledge workers and power users, and task workers, and things like that. And then we have a connectivity uh, category. Uh-oh, there's a slide missing there. So uh, a couple of examples. Uh, of those uh, workload categories I've mentioned. Well, why do we care if a user is a power user? Anyone hazard to guess? They're going to consume more resources, but not necessarily that they're going to chew up more memory 
and more CPU. I'd say that power users chew up more resources over time. For me, this is a time thing. Power users generally have administrator access, right? We allow power users to install their own applications and to manage their own IT to a very limited extent. And so what do they do? They do. They install those applications. They make modifications in the operating system, et cetera. What does that do to my initial baseline workload testing? It makes my baseline a fraction of what it ends up being. So I would say power users, across the board, we can't say that they consume more CPU and more memory. It could be they actually consume less. Power users go to meetings. Power users are knowledge workers. They're doing work. They're actually thinking or they're in meetings all day. I think meetings are sort of uh, an either-or thing with work, right? I attend a lot of meetings lately. And so now I feel like, wow, I'd really love to get out of meetings so I can go do work. And so you might find that task workers have a more sustained CPU and memory consumption rate. A fixed number of applications so those workloads don't grow over time. But when they are working, man, they are working. Have you seen any data entry people, how fast they are? It's amazing can't even see their fingers move. So these are the kinds of things I think about. In connectivity, what are the different options that I have out there? High speed, WAN speed, right? I've got LANs, I've got WANs, uh, I've got sometimes on, sometimes off, I've got mobility happening. So these are the kinds of things that we want to be thinking about as we're designing desktops. Those jobs, outcomes, and constraints apply to our use cases. So in the wheel, if you recall, the use case definition was my first phase. When I exit out of that phase, I know all of my use cases. Hopefully, I also know which use cases I want to prioritize and work on first. Hopefully, I know which use cases are targeting actual users, and maybe there's users I don't want to do anything with. Maybe there's requirements that I don't want to address. And so the use case exercise also helps me do some scoping. These desktops are in scope, and these are out of scope. So then we start to think about how we're going to address those, those use cases. And that's where we start to look at persona, desktop, and pool. And then these are the kinds of entangled decisions that you have to make along the way. In persona, are you going to go with none, and we'll just use the Windows default, uh, or go with no persistence whatsoever, uh, sort of like a lockdown profile, you can't use it? Hey, sorry if I disappointed in the session, but I hope to see you back. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Enjoy VMworld. Good luck at the tables. I might use the native operating system uh, persona, or I might go virtual. Thank God we're going virtual now, right? Who's excited about uh, uh, virtual profiles? Yeah, a couple of you out there. Cool. So next I look at the desktop. What am I actually going to create? What's the container I'm creating for people? operating system, virtual hardware that I'm assigning? Am I traditionally installing apps inside that operating system? And then I look at pool types. This is where we get into the product features of view, floating, dedicated, local mode, non-link clones, etc. And in applications, anybody know about what the, uh, what the borderline is uh, between uh, Windows apps and SaaS apps? Do we, you know where we are in terms of uh, adoption, SaaS app adoption? Agnostic operating system, anybody want to throw out a number from 1 to 100? 50. 50%, 50 believe it or not. 50% applications today are SaaS, bat, SaaS apps, OS, and browser agnostic. It's a pretty huge number, considering. So we now want to consider ways to control that. Guess what? VMware has a product for that. It's called Horizon. So make sure you check out Horizon learn about that. And then, of course... We have display protocol, and we want to talk about the display protocol because there are certain features that align to jobs that users have to do. Now, the good news is that PC over IP, which is our display protocol, has gone through a massive improvement. What are we talking about improvement for PC over IP, Tommy? Uh, up to 75%. Up to 75%. Let's give the engineers a big round of applause. There's some other company out there that has a display protocol. I can't remember who they are, but I'm sick and tired about hearing about them, man. I think, I think I blocked them out too. of mine. What's that? I think they make fruit, too. They make fruit also. Yeah, citrus. That's right. That's a type of fruit, isn't it, when I last checked? Okay. Oh, so my slides were out of order. I apologize. 
so what I wanted to do was include a uh, example of use case attributes in a nice table that you could use to, uh, to document those. I'm going to skip ahead because I'm kind of out of uh, order now and I didn't want to confuse anyone. Note to self, got to fix that order. Okay, next. When we exit out of pool design, now we're ready to talk about pod and blocks. Anybody knew, know what pods and blocks are? Yeah, a couple of you out there. This is our scalability modularity, if you will. This is how we scale view to enterprise scale. 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. When we get to 10,000, we start to suggest maybe you should be looking at another pod. The way that pods and blocks are related is that the pod is like my big view container and blocks are individual containers in there, and I have a picture of that. I know it's very clear and understandable. Made it myself, it's very colorful, I know, thank you. Please hold your applause. The thing to know about my blocks, this is my block here. The delineation point for my block is my vCenter server. What we know about the vCenter server is that there's a relationship between the efficiency of provisioning operations and recompose operations, and so my dividing line is the view block. I do that so I can scale out in a, in a controllable way, in a known way. It's a structured way. Otherwise, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to create one vCenter server and put 10,000 VMs in that. Does anybody think that's a good idea? It is, actually. Uh, we'll get there one day when we can improve the uh, provisioning operation speed uh, and concurrency of uh, provisioning uh, and power operations in vCenter, something we're working very, very hard on. Well, not we. The engineers are. They're the smart people. Uh, so we're working very hard on that. So there's really just a couple of big structures here I want to point out. Down here at the bottom, I have an entity I call the view management block. And this is where I keep my connection servers and security servers and then the supporting infrastructure, uh, like the server storage for all of those, uh, the ESX hosts that support these workloads. And that's where I put my vCenter servers for managing my blocks. I keep them in there to keep them away from desktops because I want the best user experience, which means that I've got to provide the, the most amount of physical resources to those machines. Sorry about those of you on the side here who can't really see, so I'll just stand here and block your view. And then inside my individual blocks, uh, this is my ESX clusters, if you will, and then this is where I'm sort of keeping my uh, view desktop pools, and my view pools sit on top of uh, ESX clusters. Uh, and then another interesting thing is that I could share storage or I could have storage dedicated to those individual blocks. So it's important to know that there's an obvious relationship between storage design and block design. It can be shared or it can be segregated. Okay. So I exit out of my pod and block design. Now I've got a physical layout for my logical design. I know how I'm dividing up into a management block to a view pod and to individual uh, blocks. And now I have to do the actual work of designing vSphere underneath. And so here, I'm going through one by one, adding up my workloads, sizing my workloads, uh, coming up with all of the requirements there, and I'm determining my infrastructure requirements, my access infrastructure requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And then I'm gonna go through block by block, because that's how I scale upwards. I scale upwards by block. Making sense so far? Yeah, excellent. Anyone asleep? Just snore out loud. Thanks. I exit out of vSphere, now I get into storage. Storage has been a very interesting design topic for us the last few years, wouldn't you say, Tommy? It has changed a lot. It's changed a lot. We have customers, well, we, we started out thinking, just like our customers did, that what we really cared about was the footprint, right? The footprint of all these desktops. We started to think about, well, the average uh, XP desktop needs about 10 gig, I'm gonna do 1,000 desktops. How many gigabytes is that? It's a lot of gigabytes. I'm not a math major either, so don't feel bad. So we started to think, well, that's a pretty compelling problem, so we better tell people about that, get them thinking about it. But that's not the actual challenge. Can anybody tell me what the real challenge is? IOPS, everybody knows it by now. Tommy, we've, we've done our work here. We can go home then. We can go home, we're punching out later, folks. So these IOPS turn out to be a lot more compelling, a lot more expensive to solve. At least it was more expensive to solve two years ago. But now we've got lots of vendor and, and uh, partner uh, engineering going on there. We've got NetApp and EMC who've done brilliant uh, design work around caching 
and dedupe. Uh, we've got SSD arrays that are dropping and plummeting, I would say, plummeting in price. Uh, an example is the Whiptail Sands, the whip, Whiptail Appliances, very, very high performance. I'm sorry if I disappointed you, sir. I look forward to seeing you again. So I've got my, uh, my Whiptail Appliances that are dropping in price, but I could push 200, 300,000 IOPS through those. Very, very uh, affordable price point. It's a great sand for a certain amount of uh, footprint that we know and can expect and design for and view. Uh, and the IOPS, which is a little bit more difficult uh, to constrain. So we have some white papers. We have some advice uh, for those of you out there who are trying to figure out how to design your storage for IOPS. Uh, we use a, um, a simple yet intimidating statistical process known as uh, standard deviation uh, to get there. I could tell you that for those of you who are math majors who are familiar with standard deviation, you probably want to design for about two and a half times standard deviation of peak IOPS. Don't go below that, please. Stay away from going below that. You might go to three, four, five times standard deviation. If you want to go over peak, that's fine too. In certain cases, that's important to do for your storage performance. But I won't bore you with the details because I'm no math major. On the storage side, we're thinking about the needs of my management block. In particular, I might be thinking about disaster recovery of that because if I lose my management block, then I've pretty much lost my entire view environment. So we want to make sure that we make that robust. I'm going to think about the virtual machine data stores for the operating system, disposable disks, I'm thinking about IOPS, and I'm, of course, thinking about max footprint. It's probably the, the last thing I'm worried about, though, is after I add up all my IOPS and all my workloads, then I start to think, well, do I have enough footprint here? And then I need a lot of repositories that are outside of my VM uh, data stores, things to think about, user home directories, because users love to save their data somewhere, right? We try to keep it off a of Dropbox. Anybody successful with that so far? Keep a data off a of Dropbox? I'm guilty. I'll admit it. Persistent disks, profile stores, transfer servers, templates, applications. There's a lot to think about here. And, of course, in an hour, I couldn't hope to share all the details and all the things you need to know to get through this. Uh, so I'm happy to say that at VMware, we've got some really great material that are available, directly available to partners accessible to uh, customer design teams by working through your uh, VMware sales reps, and there's a lot of training that's available out there. In fact, uh, sitting in the front row here is my colleague, Matt Coppinger, uh, who wrote uh, the first published uh, view design guide that we made available to partners, uh, and we built an uh, education course on it. So uh, there's a lot to know. This is just the highlights, uh, and if you seek out that material, then you can get the info you need. Last of all, we find that users connect to devices, right? Physically connect to devices. They type on stuff. They use stuff. They touch it. So, of course, we have to design to that. So coming in, we've got pre-existing equipment. Are we going to repurpose PCs or thin clients? And we have some OS licensing that we could take advantage of, or maybe there's some things that we need to do there. And then we consider on the client side, are we going to go with an operating system? Maybe we'll go with zero client. We care about things like monitors and devices and software and network, network connectivity specifically. We also care about client management. Does anybody know that uh, Teradici, sorry, like for example, Samsung, zero clients actually have software on them? Anybody, anybody know that? You guys all knew that, right? That was a trick question. So it's firmware, which is a type of software, but guess what? That still needs to be updated too. Maybe it doesn't have to be updated as often as Windows does, it doesn't have to be updated uh, quite with the same security breaches in mind, but we update the, that firmware because we have new features that are constantly coming out. Make sense? Yeah, excellent. Okay, so that's the design process. I'd like to talk to you about the design objectives. What are you hoping to accomplish when you are going through design motions? Of course, we've got objectives that fall into the categories of functional, non-functional, and constraints. I already talked about the functional, so that's good. We passed that. We're a third way through the deck. Who's excited about that? Yeah. We're almost done, really. So I'd like to talk about the non-functional specifications. And as we embrace this X, AAS universe, desktop as a universe, IT as a universe, et cetera, it's important to be thinking in terms of service quality, qualities, and I'm blanking out the... Uh, presentation again. 
So we start by talking about manageability. Is it really easy to manage this platform? Another quick show of hands, who, who are my partners out there? Uh, VARs in particular, right? So, so you guys are thinking in terms of my customers are the people who buy from me. Those are IT directors, right? And so we need to be designing with those users in mind, our customers, and will they be able to manage what we design and create for them? Uh, even in the, uh, in the user-architected space, and user architected space, you need to make sure that you can get through your work quickly. You can provision desktops to users uh, quickly, and that's manageability. Of course, everyone's uh, insecure. We're, we live in an insecure, hostile world, and so we care about security. So we want to make sure that uh, desktops are locked down, applications and data are locked down, uh, but yet still giving users freedom to roam. We also care about availability. Do we know what makes a user really, really angry? We said it earlier. When their desktop's not available, when their application's not available. In fact, I would go so far as to say that we could probably make users more angry with inconsistency than consistency. If it's sometimes available, sometimes not, that just really makes them angry. So if you have users you hate, and I know no one here would, would really ever uh, have a user they hate, or at least admit it, uh, the, the way to really mess with their heads is to make it so that sometimes it's really fast and sometimes their desktops are really slow. So we want a consistent experience to go along with that availability. We also want to plan for disaster, and so we want to be able to recover user desktops, recover apps, recover data. We want to be able to recover from our mistakes that we didn't anticipate uh, a uh, hurricane or tornado wiping out a data center. We want to help recover mistakes that they make, like accidentally deleting files. And of course, we care about performance. Again, uh, not just maximum performance, but consistent performance. We want to make sure that that performance meets their expectations for getting their job done, and it's predictable. Predictable performance is very important. And here's a really interesting one. Has anybody seen this before as a non-functional specification? No, it's crazy, right? That guy dodges out of his mind. Well, I'll tell you, it's love. How do we create desktops that users love? I alluded to it at the beginning. I think we focus on their outcomes. We focus on the jobs that they want to do, and we focus on their constraints, their natural constraints in working with them. Does anybody have an iPad? Does anybody have more than one iPad? I have more than one iPad, I do. Does anybody love their iPad? Somehow there are more hands of people going of people who love iPods, iPads than admitted having them. So that's really interesting. The thing about an iPad is you pick it up, you fall in love. It's love at first sight, isn't it? I remember thinking, I don't really need an iPad. I'm just, I want to see what the buzz is. I want to go check it out. And I went to the Apple store and I picked it up and I said, I need an iPad. I'm in love. I'm going to find reasons to need this device. And lo and behold, I did. Who loves Kindle? I love Kindle. I saw somebody with a hardware Kindle. I love everything about Kindles. Um, the Apple engineers set out to create a device that people would love. And I think that as architects, as consultants and designers, we should be setting out with the ambition of creating desktops that users love. And the way we do that is we focus on what users need and care about. And everything else that we, as IT folks and infrastructure architects, what we need to care about, budget, uh, constraints, uh, sorry, compliance, uh, the, the lines of business, and, and all the things that sort of are the vicious spiral that we find ourselves in. I also would say that there are several related design uh, considerations that are very, very important. For example, migration. My flock of geese here. When you sit down and you consider the path to go from legacy uh, to the post-PC era in, in view and horizon, the other things that we're doing, I would submit to you that the migration plan ends up being an important consideration in your design plan. Anyone here, for example, familiar with Profile Unity from Liquidware Labs? Yeah, several hands out there. You guys probably also own iPads. Coincidence? I think not. All right, it's probably a coincidence. What's great about uh, Profile Unity is Profile Unity has a feature that will enable you to migrate your user data, your user persona, and maybe in a future uh, release, their applications. And so it turns out that, of course, if I implement virtual profiles, and I ask 
who loves virtual profiles here, but it turns out if I, if I implement some persona management up front, then that reduces my friction migrating to view. And guess what? After that, I could just continue using that persona management tool. And in fact, that would be the recommendation that I give to customers. Implement your persona management strategy as soon as you can, because it will reduce your migration friction. So my migration plans influenced my design. Anybody thinking about the, world, the, the word entanglement right now? Yeah, definitely. I see some heads nodding. OK. So next is security. This is a real picture. I don't know. It was say it came out of an airport. I spent a lot of time in airports. I don't know how somebody looked at that and said, either that I'm going to put a monitor in front of this camera, or the security guy looked and said, you know, there's a great place to hide a camera. I'm going to put that behind a monitor. No one's ever going to see it. It'll be great. Definitely very secure. Ain't nobody ever going to steal that TV. If they do, we're going to see their face like this. <laughs> Crap, dude, there's a camera behind the television, dude. So, yeah, we don't want to be doing that. The other thing we want to consider is user administration. How are we going to administer users? Are we going to administer to the users? Or are we going to implement some self-service, some orchestration? Are the users going to take care of this themselves? And then, of course, there's tech support. So I would say that it's important uh, when you're designing view, when you're designing desktops, to make it easy to support them. Because we know that users do some pretty unpredictable things, right? Those crazy users, we love them. And they make us crazy. Is this, uh, are these uh, related design decisions making sense? So I'm saying let's consider everything that you're going to have to do over the next three years and architect it in front, up front. It's a novel concept. I've seen a lot of consulting companies, I've seen a lot of users, and I've been in the desktop space for over 20 years, uh, so I'm not talking about VMware users and, and view implementations, but I'm talking about physical desktops and Active Directory, and people don't think like this. This is uncommon sense that I'm sharing and giving to you. Okay, so I said I'd talk about constraints. There's several constraints to talk about. In fact, was that a time constraint uh, right there? How, how do we fix on time? 17. Maybe, what time? 17. OK. So there are several that are very, very important. I kind of put them here in concentric circles uh, so that I could drive them from order of importance. And I'd say it's important to design to certain quality constraints. And when is, when is quality a constraint? I think quality is a constraint in certain compliance environments. In other words, I can't go below a minimum quality. No, I can't b go below a minimum number of, number of provisioning errors, mistakes that I've made in provisioning apps or operating system requirements to users, for example. Next is knowledge. Has anybody taken a VMware education course? Right? How important is those VMware education courses to adoption of VMware products? And I would say any vendor's uh, education course. Would you say it's, a, it's significant? It's very, very important to adoption? Same is true for our companies, right? The, the customers that we work with. So if you're going to implement and use technology, then you're going to need to consider the knowledge that you need to do so. And there's some knowledge that's generic, like product education. There's some that's specific, which is how we implemented this technology for our uses. The next is standards. Has anybody tried to recommend a design, say, based on Dell servers to an HP shop? Have you ever done that? Yeah, how'd that turn out for you? Not so good, I bet. And yet it happens. In fact, uh, one of our big financial uh, customers um, in the Northeast, a banking institution, uh, had a conversation with uh, the Cisco team. Uh, and the executives decided that going with UCS was an excellent design choice. And it is. Obviously, Cisco is an excellent uh, partner of VMware's. There, there's even some sort of shared DNA in terms of uh, founders and and uh, lots of engineers kind of going back and forth, working together, et cetera. So UCS is a great platform for, for VMware products. I highly recommend it. But when you're an all HP shop, implementing UCS is a very daunting thing. And so what happened, 12 UCS uh, blade chassis showed up on the loading dock. And I believe they're still there three months later. Because all the people who have to do the rack and stack and configuration are all HP Blade guys. They don't know anything about UCS. So I would say standards are very important and a form of constraint in some cases. 
And so does anybody know a customer that doesn't have a budget that they need to stay within as a constraint? Unlimited budget, anybody? Because I've got a sales team that wants yeah. to buy them dinner. <laughs> right? So we always have to stick within a budget. And sometimes this is going to come a shock to some of you, but sometimes the budget numbers change. Sometimes they go up. It's very rare, but it has happened. And sometimes it goes down, sometimes by a lot. Okay, so I like to share my design checklist. As, as I'm starting to come to the end of my design engagements, I like to sort of go back and look at my design and, and uh, do some rationalization of it. And so I like to call this the John Dodge design checklist. I don't want to put this forward as uh, VMware intellectual property, although as an employee of VMware, I guess everything that I commit to paper ends up being VMware IP. So I like to stress simplicity. In fact, I'd like to say something that I think is uncommon sense, and that in every enterprise design, in fact, in every um, beautiful or elegant design, there's a certain amount of complexity. And the way I think about complexity is that in enterprise architecture, complexity is a price that has to be paid. It has to be pr paid by someone in the process. And I would say to you that as an architect designing an enterprise architecture, it's your responsibility to pay the price of complexity or at least make that decision. And wherever possible, make your designs simple. I say simple, I mean simple to use for users and administrators, simple to operate, simple to recover, simple to explain. But has anybody ever wondered the relative complexity of biological systems? If you think of how complicated a bird is, Right? A, a bird, we're talking about less than an ounce most of the time. But somehow it flies, it eats, it thinks, it, it uh, procreates and breeds and it goes on and it lives. It protects itself, it might be hostile, say in the form of eagles. Right? And so here we've got this relatively simple thing like a bird and yet it's actually co quite complex. Birds don't know how they fly, they just do. So what I would say is as you're designing your infrastructure, make sure you're making it as simple as possible which is a very complex thing to do. So pay the price of complexity. Also, here's another novel concept. Make sure that you're talking to your users. So I just gave you a framework of the conversation. What jobs do you do? Or what jobs are your desktops involved in? What outcomes are important to you? Are you looking for faster login? Are you looking for more reliability, more consistent performance, et cetera? Uh, do you really love the fact that you've got a big thing under your desk with a fan that sucks dirt and, and critters into it? Because, you know, we, there's another thing you could buy for that, but I'm not going to design that in a view implementation. Find a balance between business, business and technical uh, best practices. I, I know some architects. In fact, I've tried to coach them through a very difficult change, uh, which is that they seem to think that it's entirely acceptable to tell a customer, you just, look, you just absolutely have to spend twice as much uh, than, than you have to spend right now in order to do this right. And I won't budge an inch on that. Now, I kind of, I can agree with that thinking to a, to a limited extent, but I think it's important for architects to take that one step further, the infamous Palo Alto double-click. When did we start double-clicking on ideas and concepts? I don't know. I thought we did that in... in uh, applications. But anyway, so we double click on this idea and we say, okay, do I understand your business requirements and your constraints, particularly budgetary constraints? And we have that conversation a little bit different, uh, a little bit differently than I absolutely am going to make a stand on technical best practices and I communicate it as if we want to achieve those business outcomes, that's going to influence the technical design and vice versa. So let's make sure we have that conversation in the right way. We also need the design rationales. Why did we design things a certain way? What were we hoping to achieve by designing that? I've seen a lot of, uh, as part of the practice team that I ran for a year and a half, I've reviewed a lot of designs. And in some cases, I'm looking at a fairly well done enterprise architecture design. And then I, I run into uh, some design decisions that were made that were very confusing. And I don't know why those decisions were made. Has anyone uh, ever encountered that? Has anyone perhaps created a design document where someone else reading it has had that experience? I certainly have, and I'll admit it. Happily. I confused, your, I confused you with doing that, didn't I? So the rationale behind these things is important, too. It puts it in context. 
Uh, last year, our tech marketing team put out a reference architecture for using uh, locally uh, installed SSD drives for a non-persistent architecture. It was a pretty decent paper. I had a very specific perspective in mind, and the non-persistent uh, part of the architecture was a design constraint because we could make persistent disks fit into the size SSD drives that uh, Intel had provided us. That wasn't the objective anyway. We were trying to do you know, non-persistent uh, floating pool desktops uh, in a uh, BPO use case. So a customer took that reference architecture, implemented it almost precisely as we uh, wrote it up, and then they gave, it to, uh, they gave it to users to use as a persistent model. Can anyone predict the outcome here? It, it failed. Um, there was no rationale behind that decision. They, they didn't know why they were doing it. I would also say that in your designs, especially in your design documentation, you should strive for clarity over ambiguity. What happens when our writing, when our designs are ambiguous? Anybody know? What's that? Yeah, you confuse people. Either that or uh, we get a, a word, could be a bad word, we get interpretation. I interpreted your design to look like this. I'm like, okay, why is it red and resembling a Volkswagen? I didn't have that in mind. How did you come up with that interpretation? So the way that we can avoid that uh, is to just design with clarity, right, and avoid ambiguity. If we had something in mind, then we should state that. We should state it clearly and not leave it subject to the implementer's interpretation. <coughs> something else that's very interesting, too. Does anyone create designs deliberately so that they could be reused, reusable, redeployed? Probably some of my partners out there, right? I see some heads being nods. Nodded. Well, it's very important to do that. When I do that for, when I do designs for a customer, to me, it's a knowledge sharing process too. There's a lot of ideas that go into a uh, architecture that I create for a customer. I try to design that architecture so if the customer needs to, they could take that design and implement it in another data center somewhere else in their infrastructure. I used to be in business for myself, uh, and one of my partners was the VP of sales, and to him, that was a uh, lost opportunity. Hey, you made that design so good that they didn't need us to do that fresh install, uh, that fresh install in the other data center. But the interesting thing is that in every time that I've done that, I've always been invited back to do more design work. And that's really what we're after, right? We don't want to just do one thing and create this artificial lock-in. That artificial lock-in, you get resentment. And do customers that hate us and resent us buy more from us? Well, yeah, sometimes they do. But more often than not, with every, more, with every interaction, that they, they grow more intense in their resentment. They look for more and more reasons to go find another vendor. And I don't want that to happen. Nor do I want those of you who are users to be annoyed by consultants either. So I try to create a lot of value by doing that, by making my designs reusable. We come back to simplicity. At the end of the day, after we consider all of these things in our design checklist, we have to ask ourselves again, did I make this as simple as possible? I would put it in another way to you. What can you remove from your design without changing its purpose? How do we make this design a little bit simpler? Because that's very difficult to do, but oftentimes we get to the best designs not by adding things, not by adding features, but by removing them, by taking things out that are superfluous, unnecessary, adding complexity. Does that make sense? Anybody disagree? No, I totally agree with everything I wrote. I've lived it. I've lived it a bunch. Right, Tommy? What do you do you agree? I would agree, Jerry. You didn't raise your hand. I did not raise my hand. My feelings were hurt. I'm sorry. Thank you. I'll Thank buy you a beer saying. later. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So I just want to take a moment and talk about logical and technical specifications. Because if anybody in the room was feeling a little little drowsy and wanted to nod off, this would be a really good topic to, to do it. I've looked at a lot of design documents. I've reviewed a lot of customer designs, a lot of designs uh, created by uh, VMware consultants submitted to me. Say, I just need your stamp of approval on this before I ship it out. I'm like, whoa, you know, I don't have a rubber stamp sitting on my desk that just comes out and I go, Pff. that doesn't happen. I actually read this stuff. So 
the more design documents to see, the more confusion I see. I see a, a mixture of uh, logical and technical specifications, and they come mashing up uh, in, in the most horrible way. Uh, you know, it's like, like wearing uh, uh, white pants after Labor Day. You just don't want to do it. So, again, in this concept of simplicity, you want to keep similar aspects of your design together. Design your logical, create your logical design first and put all your logical design elements together. Group them together so that somebody sits down to read your design, to understand your design, they, they uh, progress through maybe high level to increasing levels of details, but it's all logical. Has anybody uh, sort of created a design doc, and it's okay to admit this because I'll admit that I've done it. I've probably done it more years than I haven't done it, but I create my design docs up front. I have kind of like a high level uh, logical overview. And then immediately I go into server specifications, network jacks, bandwidth, speeds, fees, that kind of stuff. Anybody done that? Yeah, you have. I know you have. I have too. That's not good. It doesn't promote understanding. So later in your doc, do all your technical specifications uh, together, and here's the uncommon sense. Have it follow the same order as your logical specification, because then it's kind of like, uh, you know, front, front section, back section. Let's line them up. Makes it really easy to comprehend. Also, re avoid re repeating details wherever possible. So I read uh, one design doc in particular that specified repeatedly uh, that connection servers had uh, two CPUs and 10 gigabytes of RAM, three, four sections throughout the document. It said that over and over again. And in one section only did it repeat those three, but then it included other things like, well, it's going to have this speed connection and it's going to live in this management block. And I thought to myself, why not say that once? For my uh, partners and maybe my architects who have been in the business a long time, do you ever reuse your own work? I totally promote it. Why, why recreate when you can reuse, right? It's recycling. Uh, I print out documents, I leave them on my desk for two weeks, and then I recycle. That's my job. That's what I do. So I repeat, my, I reuse my work. And when I do that, I find that if I have lots of repetition in there, then that can create a lot of uh, editing artifacts, as I like to call them, and they can be really bad. So I've got a couple of checklist items for you here, just to kind of highlight the obvious. Avoid repeating configure items, configuration items or specifications. Make high-level logical designs easy to find and understand, and keep technical specifications separate for only the interested party, only the people who want to dive deep into that. Do we really care? Okay, so I'm going to build this slide out, and I'm just going to talk about these things really quick. These are things that we have learned over time. These are the implementation best practices. I'm just going to rip through them pretty quickly here with loads of information on it. OS optimization. Optimize your operating systems for view. Or you could just instantly double the amount of resources you need in CPU and memory. Keep an eye on your antivirus resource demands. Because as it turns out, by pure resource consumption, especially IOPS and memory, antivirus is the number one, consistently in every environment I've looked at, the number one business critical application. Consume so much resource doesn't really do anything. How many security departments publish their stats anymore and say, this is how many viruses we've stopped today in this month? This is how quickly we, we constrain the outbreak. No one's even tracking it anymore. It just, you just assume that 30% of all your resources are attacks to be paid for antivirus protection. It's like the mafia. It's crazy. Our vendors are getting really good about that, by the way. Great products on the floor. Go check out uh, Trend and McAfee and uh, Semantic has some great products that are coming out. Storage design is something that I touched upon earlier, but it's so essential. Learn uh, standard deviation and employ it uh, in your configurations. I'll also point out PC over IP integration. PC over IP is based on UDP. It's a real-time protocol. So make sure that you understand what the implications there are. Walk your customers through implementing PC over IP in the network. It's a similar process to voice over IP. In fact, what I tell customers is design your PC over IP so that it's one level in a quality of service below voice over IP. Not above, but below. One level below. And then also I'd like to stress that it's important to have that business case. Why are we transforming your desktops? Because there's no one-for-one no one 
legacy physical to a virtual desktop. You have to change the way you do things. But you know what? The environment, the world is changing anyway. So you're stuck with this. So let's do it well. Let's make the sense. Last of all, I'd say avoid the meandering path to failure. Here is the path to success. Do an assessment. Do a proof of concept that you understand that the concept, the business case, uh, the concept and the business case are, are related. Do a pilot. Real live users doing real live work before you go to production. Please, could you please do that? Failing to do that means that your users are using infrastructure that have not been properly vetted uh, by users before, and that always ends badly. Do your production design after your pilot, because you're going to learn things in that process. So I would say what users are using in a pilot is a prototype design, and you want to have a production design phase. And last of all, go to production deployment and go there safely. Go there successfully. Go there with the confidence that you'll be successful. Does that make sense? I think this is a great place for me to wrap up my presentation. I'd like to say thank you very much for attending my session today. Thank you very much for your support of VMworld. Thank you. <laughs>